Hello everyone, welcome to a week of Linux news for the 8th of January 2017. I hope you have all survived the first week back at work this year. As a shift worker, I had the pleasure of working Christmas Day and only got New Year's off. Oh well. Anyway, I'm starting the year with a long-lived vulnerability in libpng which appeared 21 years ago back in 1995. The potential null dereference bug has existed in libpng since version 0.71 on 26th of June 1995. In order to trigger the exploit, an application has to load a chunk of text into the PNG structure, then delete all the text, then add another text chunk into the same PNG structure. Slackware reports that it has happened, however I have been unable to substantiate that claim. LibPNG is used in all operating systems. As far as Linux goes, it appears that all distributions have been prompt at supplying updated versions of LibPNG in the system repositories. So as long as you do your updates, there's nothing to worry about. Researchers have discovered a Linux variant of the KillDisk ransomware. However, this version is rather nasty. Not only does it cost a small fortune to decrypt your hard drive, the decryption doesn't even work on Linux. So according to the ESET researchers, the way KillDisk ransomware version works on Windows and Linux is completely different, with the biggest issue being that on Linux, a KillDisk doesn't save the encryption key anywhere on the disk or online. Normally, this would mean that victims would never be able to recover files since the encryption key would be lost immediately after the encryption process ends. The good news is that ESET researchers have said they've uncovered a flaw of the Linux variant that permits them to recover the encrypted files. The same weakness does not exist in the versions that targets Windows PCs. The files are encrypted using triple DES applied to 4096-byte file blocks and each file is encrypted using a different set of 64-bit encryption keys. And there's a list of folders here, and I suppose notable ones here include slash etc, so your application settings will be gone, slash mnt, any hard drives connected to your system, slash home, so all your documents. I'll tell you what, I think that's actually most of the list there, isn't it, really? And upon boot up, you see that nasty message there on the Grub bootloader. So it's not just a case you can reinstall the Grub bootloader, your hard drive has been encrypted. Ouch. The price for decryption is 222 bitcoins. I think that was over $215,000 at the time of writing. Kaspersky have written a report on a new Trojan affecting Android called Trojan Android OS Switcher, which is similar to DNS Changer Trojan that affected Windows between 2007 and 2012. This time around, the Trojan launches a password guessing attack over Wi-Fi connection to the router, and if successful, it changes the router's primary DNS to an IP controlled by the attacker, and changes the secondary DNS to Google's public DNS. The result would be any website queried could return a page controlled by the attacker. Your personal information and banking details could be handed over very easily, and you would be oblivious. Unless they screwed up the HTTPS certificates, then maybe your browser would give you a clue that something is wrong. The Trojan Android OS switcher has predominantly hit Asia. There is no mention of where the Trojan comes from, but I expect it's preloaded in dodgy apps outside of the Play Store. However, there is a lesson to learn here. Don't use a simple password on your router, or at least change it from the default, which is probably just admin admin. After 13 years, the open source video transcoder handbrake has hit version 1.0. Hmm, video transcoder. Yeah, a byproduct of its features is that it can rip DVDs, as long as you have the libdvd CSS decoder installed on your system. KDE Plasma 5.8.5 has been released. This updates a long term support version of Plasma 5 desktop, is focused mostly on bug fixes. I have left a link to the full change list in the video description. Inkscape version 0.92 has been released. A quick mention of the features here. New mesh gradients. Enabling artists to easily create photorealistic drawings. Ooh, that sounds good. Dots per inch DPI has been increased from 90 to 96 DPI. Opensource.com have put together a list of eight fun Raspberry Pi projects to try. I think I saw about that one a while back, where you got, can add text to a mirror. Cody Media Center. And I have to say, it does run very well on the Raspberry Pi Model 3. A Raspberry Pi weather station. Can run Fedora 25 on it. Pi hole. No, use no track. Server level ad blocking. Yes, well. Mine's more of a tracker blocking, but it can do advert blocking as well. 
RetroPie gaming machine. I tried this out on the Raspberry Pi Model 2, and yeah, I have to say it's reasonable, but it's not perfect. Comprehensive security system, different, using the cameras. Real-time Android, don't know, not familiar with that one. Another useful article from opensource.com, 50 ways to avoid being hacked in 2017. Yes, the list is quite long, but uh, I think out of them all, points 24 and 25 were particularly relevant. The most hacks are social engineering, for example email links, web browser attacks and phone calls. The best option here is to be educated and sceptical. No one from Nigeria is giving you money. The IRS is not calling your house demanding money. If you get a link to a website, an email from your bank, don't use the link. Type the address direct on your web browser. Very sensible. And point number 25, always keep your systems fully up to date with the latest security fixes. The number of systems that are outdated and have known security vulnerabilities is scary. Script kiddies rely on you not to update your system. Again, very relevant. There's quite a few more in the list, so I'll leave a link to that in the description. Sorry to have to go back to Android again, but this story did look amusing initially with a ransomware infected LG Smart TV. In the case of a ransomware infection like this, the best bet is to do a factory reset. And unfortunately for the owner, Darren Corfun, the factory reset method is undocumented and LG would only send out a repairman at a cost, which was far more than the TV was worth. Things blow up on Twitter and it seems that LG have handed over the factory reset code. And Darren has made a YouTube video showing the malware cleanup process. As the line between computers and TVs has blurred, we can expect more instances of smart TVs becoming infected with malware. I wonder how many perfectly good smart TVs will get thrown out because the cost of cleaning the malware exceeds the value of the TV. Hmm, I might have to check out eBay. And that was a look at the news. Thanks for watching. See you all later.